Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome to another live session with The Hype Magazine. I'm your editor-in-chief, Jerry Doby, and this evening, this evening, this evening, I'm really excited to be able to talk to this film director. His name is Zach Kashket, and he has this amazing project for which I've seen the trailer. I've reserved the right to watch the documentary until after the conversation, but it's called The Mad Writer, and it is... An obvious, meaty labor of love between Zach and his friend, Austin, also known as Larange. And the background for Zach is, oh my God, he's an editor from Netflix and more Netflix and more Netflix and some Adult Swim and... He has come from out of the booth, the editing booth, um, to write, direct, produce, and edit this slam dance selection, film festival selection in 2023 called The Mad Writer. And uh, I want to welcome you, Zach. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Matt. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. I like to talk about good creativity and things like that and get to know people from behind the camera who come up with these amazing ideas and have the slick tongue, the pimpology, if as it were, to get people to get in front of the camera and tell stories and let the camera tell the story about them that they may not have ordinarily done. I think that's 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 some dolomiteness right there, my brother. That's yeah. dope. That's dope. Um, so, for, but from the inside looking out, I would like to know, besides your professional accolades, how you see Zachary Kashkat? How I see Zachary Kashkat? Yeah. Oh, man. That's not the question I thought you'd ask. Uh, how I see Zachary Kashkat? Well, I'm a film editor. I'm a very, very passionate about being a film editor. I've been a film editor my entire life. Like um, I got into it. I don't know why I got into it when I was super young, like uh, 12, 13 years old. And it's actually how I met LaRange was um, I went to like an art summer camp for film editing and he just randomly was on the dorm hall that I was on and I, I met him that way. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's uh, weird being in a director's chair. I've always considered myself an editor and it's really like my identity. And um, yeah, I've been studying that my whole life. So it's it's a bizarre uh, mm. turn of events right now. But yeah, that that's how I, how I consider Zach Cashman. Was there a defining moment that made you turn the corner for this specific project? What was it that drove you? What was it that drove me? I mean, honestly, uh, I had been, uh, I wish I, I had a more altruistic answer. Like I just had to make a film about LaRange, but the truth is, the truth is that, uh, I had just come off like a year and a half film that kind of blew up in my face. And right at the end, we were about to, um, sell the project and the two directors started fighting with each other and the film dissolved, went away after about a year and a half. And, uh, Right around that same time, I had like a minor financial windfall and I said to myself, like, I have to do something with this money to um, push my career forward, to like do something that would make me, uh, I guess, take the stink off this film that had just blown up in my face for one. And um, and I was sort of looking around for a project and that's when it sort of just like the dominoes fell in my head and I realized I had this uh, access to this, one of my best friends and my oldest friends was a, a hip hop producer who was starting to like really get well known. And um, it felt like, like the pieces were kind of coming together for him. So in some ways it just felt like eventually someone is going to knock on his door and, and say, I, I would like to do the um, documentary version of your story. And I, figured if it, it was going to be someone, it might as well be me. And who better than me if, uh, like, who closer to him, who could make a more authentic film about him than an old friend. So uh, those, uh, yeah, that was, that was really the reason. In the clip, he seemed, you know, really resistant. One clip is, <laughs> I think this is a big mistake. 
Yeah. How did you overcome that trepidation that he had? From him? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess the uh, easy answer is we didn't. Like, we just kind of enveloped it into the film. Like, really early on, it just became clear that, um, well, his personality was always one of the big reasons I thought that a film about him would work. He's just such a unique individual and uh, has such a unique sense of humor. Uh, and I knew that sort of part of that was this sarcastic, dark, you know, whatever, too cool for school thing. So I knew I would encounter some some resistance. He made that very clear. Yeah. But uh, yeah, as we started to shoot, I think just our interpersonal dynamic and our friendship kind of came out like, you know, it was hard for him to take me seriously in the directing chair. He's known me as an editor and his buddy for 20 years. And so um, when that dynamic started presenting itself on film, it just like immediately became clear that this was compelling and, uh, and rather than try to cut around it, we should try to, um, you know, make it a, a real staple of the film. And I think it made it a little more complex and interesting too, you know, like uh, we've all seen, I've worked on especially like uh, musician films that it's basically just a um, long advertisement and it, right. this was not that, this was never gonna be that and yeah, so. Yeah. He, he's you know, as I listen to his music, his music is deeper than that. Yeah. But also, you know, you're addressing, you know, mental health in a creative, which is magnified, you know, oftentimes 10, maybe even 50 in a creative as opposed to, and not to, to lessen, uh, you know, the impact on anyone else's life who, who suffers from any mental health situation but creatives are so in touch with themselves and their version of the world as they see it that it can be really intense kind of like you know someone who's lived their life in combat um you know trying to engage with the rest of the world it's just not that easy um to overcome what you dealt with or what you're dealing with and struggling with internally so you know, in turning the camera on someone. And then he was also having some physical problems. We can talk about this because this is in the trailer, obviously, you yeah. know, um, some bleeding from the ears and the, the potential to lose hearing in perhaps one of those ears um, and still try to strive to move forward. So you've addressed all these things with your friend. Emotionally, how did it, this journey work on you, Zach, the director and friend? Oh man. As you told the story. Yeah, I mean, it was difficult. Like, uh, um, yeah. When we first started shooting him, the intention was to kind of make like a more comprehensive biofilm, like that sort of told more of his history and, um, and about a month into shooting, he called me and told me this, that he was dealing with this situation with his ear and he was bleeding and didn't know why. And um, it, it was really a turning point for the movie and uh, and a scary thing, like both as his friend, but also like as a filmmaker, I didn't know that I wanted to be like at the helm of a, something that could feel exploitative. I didn't want to like feel like I was taking advantage of something negative in his life. And um, uh, I think, because of what he was going through, it made him a little bit more vulnerable or a little more open to talk about certain things that otherwise he might've been a little bit more guarded with. Um, so I don't know, I, I felt like it got, it helped us get to the kind of heart of the matter a little quicker just cause I guess nerves were frayed or something. Like he was just at a, at a specific place. Um, but as his friend, I mean, like watching him go through that was really, really tough. And uh, especially like, you know, the original intention of the film was to talk about his career and to talk about all these amazing things that he had on the horizon and to be sitting in this place where like those things were in jeopardy was really difficult. Um, uh, yeah, I think it, for, for me personally, if that was your question, like, what it was like for me to go through, especially, you know, 
dealing with his mental health journey and everything. Um, you know, I have mental health uh, runs in my family, some mental health issues. And uh, it was something that I really connected with and uh, felt like he had like a really unique perspective on. And um, I think his perspective really kind of changed my perspective in a lot of ways. Like I, I totally look at a lot of issues differently now, just kind of living in his world for a few years uh, in, inside the edit of the film. Um, but also just the act of making the film was a little tough for us, like for Austin and I, for Laurence and I, you know, I, it put some strain on our friendship at times. And um, certainly like a, there were a lot of uh, unforeseen outcomes that, um, that I definitely learned from and grew from and, um, yeah, feel like I feel like we came out the other side better for, I suppose. So, you know, it was an adventure, but yeah. you were deposited safely on the other side at yeah. the, end of the project, which is the most important. We're here to talk about it. Um, I'm excited about it. Just from the trailer, I'm excited. I'm going, whoa, okay. There are a lot of things to to deal with um, from the side of the creative. And I've always wanted to expose a story on a creative that is dealing not only on the mental level, but the physical level. Not wishing bad on anyone, but knowing that there are those that are going out there and just to be trusted uh, with this, the story or the sharing of this story um, became kind of important to me. And not from a, a id type of situation, but just from a hu hu human side. You know? um, well, I appreciate that. So, uh, and and... How did you deal? I mean, there's a rise of movies regarding the hearing impaired. And, you know, or, you know, with hearing impaired central characters, uh, yeah. sound of metal, coda, et cetera. So um, when you covered this, I don't, I haven't seen it, so I don't know who narrated it or what type of narration there is, but when you covered this specific, um subject matter how did you present it how do you feel like you presented it was it a technical presentation or a from the heart presentation definitely from the heart i mean the whole movie is from the heart like it's such a homemade kind of a feel the movie mm -hmm. like uh, you know we don't make a lot of bones of we didn't have like super fancy cameras we didn't have a million dollars like it was really a ragtag team um, um, myself, my producer, John Webb, and uh, my brilliant director of photography, Trevor Metcher. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, there, it, we presented the only way we thought we could because we didn't have the bells and whistles to fake anything. It, it, it kind of had to be authentic and from the heart. And um, I feel like we almost consciously tried to not bite off more than we could chew. Like we tried to not try to make grand statements about what this could be like for anyone else. Was, we try to keep it really personal to LaRange and the experience he was going through. Um, you know, for no other reason than he's a very, uh, I don't want to say closed off, but he's, a, he's a, um, you know, he doesn't go out a lot. He spends a lot of time at home by himself. He's sort of isolated in a way. And so I wanted it to be a, a really insular, um, up close and personal portrait of what his life is like. And I don't think uh, just my personal feelings on him, I don't think he's like outwardly trying to change hearts and minds. He's he's a very authentic person just living the life that he lives. And so, uh, yeah, when it came to some of the mental health topics and, and certainly the um, the ear struggle and, and the journey he was on with that, we just wanted to kind of take a hands-off approach and let him be the narrator of his own story and um, yeah, speak from the heart about that. Okay, so you mentioned that really there are three of you, you're using small small team tactics to make this happen. Yeah. Uh, you We know that you're a friend. How, what was the relationship uh, of the crew to LaRange as well? So, uh, so my producer, John Webb, who's a really great director in his own right, I had been cutting uh, his music videos for years, some of which were for LaRange. Okay. So they had worked together in that capacity. Um, so I knew that they would 
he would be comfortable around uh, John because they had already known each other. Um, and John was just integral to, you know, this is my first project as a director. So John was really like a, a great person to kind of hold my hand through the process and show me what I didn't know. Uh, but, and Trevor, you know, they, there was a lot of times where um, Trevor would go out and shoot LaRange and I wasn't even there. I would send him out on kind of scout missions or they're not doing anything important. They're just going to go on a bowling date or something like that. Him and his, his girlfriend at the time go shoot that. And um, I think they got along. I mean, you know, as much as you, as much as Laurent is going to get along in that situation, like, you know, we were asking a lot of him. He really didn't want the project to happen at all. Mm. And so kind of every minute we were there, it was like, we were, we knew we were asking for grace and, and that he was um, way out on a limb on our behalf. So we were, we tried to, you know, not being his way when he wanted us out of the way. And, uh, you know, we wanted to like get the footage that we needed, but we were trying to be respectful. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think he really uh, is happy that it's over, but he was accommodating, as accommodating as he could be to our crew, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And, and was it several years? How many years was this project in the making? Like eight, something like yeah, it was like, I mean, if we count the whole thing, it's about eight. It's like, uh, it was about a year of multiple, just trying to wear him down, basically conversations, trying to pitch him this project and um, bringing on John was a part of that to make him feel comfortable and just brainstorming and kind of coming up with conceptually what it would be. And then um, when we finally got the go ahead, uh, we got the first, we sort our first shoot was sort of a proof of concept. We didn't know if it'd be a short or if it'd be a feature or something. And so um, when we finally got to go ahead to do that shoot, that was in October, 2015. Um, wow. Yeah, and so, and then we didn't get the last thing off until just about 2020, at the beginning of 2020, the um, very end of 2019. And so, and then the rest of the time has just been editing. So about, about seven, eight years, um, but not all shooting certainly. Um, but even while we were editing, you know, I'd call him and we'd do phone interviews and fill in things that I felt like I needed. And um, the film really took a journey. Like it was at different times, a completely different movie. So um, the the things I needed from him probably seemed unending because I was always coming back with a new line that he was like, how does this fit in with the last thing you needed from me or a new topic I needed him to talk about or, mm -hmm. um, but the truth was we were just trying a new angle on the film, so. What I found really interesting <clears throat> was finding out that he refused to have any creative uh, input yeah. into the finished product and was, how did you, how did you receive that and, and, what made you the most nervous about <laughs> hearing that? Well, um, I mean, it's like a filmmaker's dream to hear that, especially, um, you know, I've been, I've been working on, I, we've, I've done work on artist docs and um, certainly my company has worked on a lot of artist docs and they can go a lot of different ways depending on how much the artist wants to be involved in the doc or how much the artist's team wants to be involved in the finished product. Um, so it's awesome when you hear from an artist, I trust you, go do your thing. And um, I don't want to see it until it's done. But man, is it daunting. Like, mm. it's really scary. And uh, definitely, I think if he had wanted to be more involved, I probably would have finished it sooner. Mm. Uh, like, if he had just been like, no, you're doing it wrong. It needs to be this. I probably, as an editor, would have just driven in that direction and tried to make that work. Um but one of the really generous things that he gave me on top of letting me do this was letting me figure out how to do this my way and, and what I wanted to do. And um, it wasn't clear from the beginning to me what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted to make a film on him. I wasn't clear what kind of film it would be. So it was a really, um, I look at it as like a gift from a friend. It was really, you know, he didn't, I think on some level, he doesn't really, he didn't really care if this came out or not. Like if it, if it died on the vine, it would have been all the same to him. So the stakes were a little bit lower, I suppose. Um, and I think he cared about me and just recognized that this was something I was endeavoring to do and wanted to do it right and um, allowed it. Yeah. 
You know, it's an, amazing, it's an amazing story of a relationship between two people that this project came about, yeah. you know, from, I would, I would like to say completely different personalities and outlooks uh, with him being more of the introvert, self-reflective, I don't want to say self-absorbed because that kind of would make him seem selfish yeah. because he gives so much in his music yeah you know when you when you analyze the music that's that's a gift he's like he's really communicating there and he's giving you something that he hopes will be of value um and if you get it you get it if you don't okay he moves on to the next one he he has no id situation going on there he just yeah. hopes um so yeah it's greater than just you know oh, we got this documentary about this producer and artist by this guy who's like a really well-known editor. Um, it's really a relational story, um, a, a metaphor for trust and belief in humankind to understand and present the story of others. Uh, kind of, you know, a journalistic endeavor, so to speak. You know, you're getting the who, what, when, where, and why, but at the same time, it's not the why of the journalist, it's the why of the subject. And I think that is... Yeah. Okay. We're going to take it that deep here at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, wow, very okay. well put, man. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so so much. I appreciate it. I would like to know what is the most satisfying for Zach about what he does? And why he does it oh i don't know that i could answer the second one i wish i could um some days i wish i could talk myself out of doing it like it's, <sighs> a, it's a hard thing and stressful thing uh, fil film editing especially but filmmaking in general um uh the first question was what was my favorite thing about what i do or yeah, it was the most satisfying part about what satisfying. I love film editing specifically. It's my favorite part about filmmaking and really uh, jumping into the, the director's chair on this was clarifying and helpful for that for me. Um, and so what I love so much about editing is this uh, feeling like you're, um, you're, you're like both solving a Rubik's cube, but building it at the same time. You're like, you're, there is a, there is always a, uh, definitive right answer, but there's often multiple right answers or multiple ways to get to the same right answer. And um, I guess I just love the journey of it. Like I find the uh, journey really satisfying. Like when you reach a conclusion, you feel like the, you feel the work that went into the conclusion. And so um, this project especially really tapped into all of those things for me because it took so long and it, it from the jump was so kind of unclear where we were going with it or exactly the final, what the exact final outcome would look like. So the journey became the whole thing for me. It was like the, the road from the beginning to the end was the fun part. And the satisfying part is feeling like we, um, we figured it out in the end. Like it's, it's um, in some ways, like almost the harder it is, the, the more gratifying, that is in the end when you feel like you cracked the nut. Um, and so, you know, like in my day-to-day -day life as an editor, uh, I get a lot of satisfaction and gratification out of uh, the director being really happy with my work or feeling like I intuitively knew what he or she wanted from the project. But um, personally, what I get out of it is is this like, uh, I feel like in some ways, like what, like, I'm gonna sound like an idiot, but like, uh, people who went like hunting for gold a long, long time ago, like on long journeys to find bounties or whatever. I feel like that sometimes, like you're an adventurer, like out on the seas, trying to find a, the final rest stop or whatever. Like you, it, 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 um, it can feel like you're, you're uh, on a long adventure trying to, to find the ending. And I love that. Okay. Well, you know, I would like to put my disclaimer in here now uh, that I don't have a professional video editor. I am not a professional video editor. And therefore, what you see is what you're going to get. 
when these videos are encapsulated inside of this editorial. So be prepared. <laughs> Please don't judge me. Because <laughs> I'm not cutting out anything. If you curse, it's going in there. If you blink, sneeze, or cough, it's going in there. So okay. we have, I, I just don't want to be judged. I'm terrified now that I'm interviewing this major editor. And um, for God's sake, I've got to freaking use video in an interview. <laughs> well, I'm a terrible interview interviewee. Like, I'm very new at this. So thank you so much for being so great at this. And I, I apologize if I seem like a, a, I'm bad at this. I, yeah, no, this brother, we're having a conversation. Interview. No, yeah. no. I think for me and my why, the most satisfying about what I do in my second career here is um, – being able to allow someone to tell their story the way they feel it needs to be told. And why I do is because, damn it, we don't have enough of that. Yeah, People are telling their stories um, in the media without the media freaking putting their opinion on it. But this is not our job. Our job is who, what, when, where, why. And, you know, when tough questions need to be asked, follow up and ask those tough questions, demand answers for the people. But in a situation like this, when we're talking about creativeness, you know, my job is to get all the juice out of the meat. Yeah. You know, we're going to chew this steak till it's gone and liquefied. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's as long as you're comfortable. So it's a conversation. And the fact that it goes from interview to conversation is, is a compliment, I think. Uh, to the two people who are engaged. So uh, anyway, I'm old. Who cares what I think? Yeah, come on. <laughs> I care. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, I would, you know, I want to respect your time. I know that it's late and oh, uh, I appreciate your patience with me. Um, talk to me about the current stage uh, we've, we've talked about the health issues and the, the, the physical health and the mental health issues that are um, show, showcased and highlighted here in the, in the documentary, um, The Mad Writer. But what's the status of uh, Laranja's career now that, you know, he experienced these medical things without giving a spoiler um, as to what actually happened? Maybe you could give us an update. Well, his career is doing great. I mean, he's, if, first of all, he, one of the, I feel the um, unfortunate things about the film ended up being that while we set out to make this comprehensive biofilm, we really landed in a place where we kind of realized we needed to uh, make it more a window into this one experience that he was having in this one specific period of time. Um, because it was just more authentically what we had gotten. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, but he's, his career has totally taken off since we started shooting and like the album that's really covered in the film a great album since then he has started working with uh Salem brigham and uh as a group they're called marlo and they have completely like taken over they're touring through europe and they're on gatorade commercials and 7-eleven i mean they're they're killing it um so yeah i mean like i without ruining the film, he's really overcome a lot in terms of his uh, health issues to be able to uh, completely propel his career forward. And um, he's done so many amazing things since uh, the events of the documentary. Um, so not to undercut the documentary, but, but man, his career is doing great. And uh, he's releasing like some of the best music of his career now hearing in mono, essentially. It's crazy. Um, I... Uh listen to all three of the Marlowe's and uh, you know, as I explained to him, I received each one of them differently. Um, there are different stories, different sonics, different presentations, yeah. different nuances and layers, uh, which I love the fact that he's heavy on that, um, yeah. that he focuses, you know, in the forties, fifties kind of um, sonics. And um, he's a treat. He, yeah. It's like it's being exactly sitting in a session with Gamble and Huff in Philadelphia as they create the Philly sound, you know, freaking deep. 
So, yeah. I, and I, I didn't mean to cut you off. You were going no, to no, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I was just going to say I, he's such a conceptual um, musician. That's one of the things that I really like as a filmmaker love about his music because you can listen to a Larange album and close your eyes and it feels like you're watching a movie in your head. Like you, you really are transported somewhere. And so um, he hasn't seen the film yet, but I hope that he responds or respects that aspect in the film that I, I, I really tried to do the same, that uh, it's a story, but I'm really trying to make you feel like you're right there in the room with him. And um, yeah. I like, <clears throat> From the trailer, it, it certainly made me lean forward um, and, you know, look forward to the next segment, whatever clip you were going to put, throw in there. So I'm going, you know, it really kind of made the mouth water, it wet the appetite for the entire project. So well done. And I'm an ass. So I am very difficult, <laughs> difficult, um, very difficult. No, no, that's great. Oh, I'm happy to hear I, it. I love it. I love it. What's coming up? And maybe I asking this question out of out of out of turn. Let yeah. me let me no, well, I'm gonna quickly analyze the flow. But oh. uh <laughs> I wanted to uh know what's coming up because you have such and I don't want to go into INDB and read off all your credits and because these people don't care. I don't read the freaking liner notes on albums anymore. So, no. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> tell me what's coming up uh, that's not top secret. For, for me. Yeah. So I, I actually, this week I'm starting a film. I'm cutting a um, true crime movie for Netflix. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not supposed to say too much about it, but it's a crazy um, female serial killer story. And um, yeah, I'm excited about it, but uh, I'm, I'm going right back <laughs> into some dark stuff. So that's somehow within the last three or four years kind of become, uh, I don't want to say like my bread and butter, something that I've been working a lot on is true crime. And so um, I don't know how that happened. I, I enjoy working on it. It doesn't seem to phase me as much as other people, some of the dark stuff, but Anyway, yeah, that's what I'll be doing next. Okay. Uh, next six months or so. Officially selected by Slam Dance, what they're in the 29th year, the Slam Dance Film Festival. <laughs> when you got the word that you're one of only two music related films to be accepted this year um, at Slam Dance. What was your initial reaction? And, you know, did you do the jump for joy thing? Oh, yeah. I mean, so I got I got the call um, from one of the programmers like late at night, oddly, and uh, like at like eight or nine and I was cooking and my wife was in the room and yeah, I freaked out. I mean, I, I really w made this movie because I felt kind of compelled to like I, you know, I explained the circumstance that I was in at the time, but truly like you know i just felt like there were like i felt like a mosquito who had hit a vein like i it just it's uh, every time i shot him it felt like it was working so i felt like i had to keep going um but i had no idea what would be next for the film you know like i hoped someday someone would see it and propel it forward into some bigger arena but i really didn't know past entering it into a you know, a handful of film festivals, what to do next with it. Um, and Slam Dance was a dream festival from the start. Uh, it was at the top of our list. And uh, because of the type of film that they usually program, like, uh, like there's a lot of great festivals, but um, there's a couple like Slam Dance, South by uh, Dead Center or Off Center and um, Telluride that like kind of accept these off the beaten path kind of weird, sometimes a little edgier films, then that's just like always been the stuff that I gravitate to. I, this is stuff I watch and apparently the stuff I make when given the uh, opportunity, I, I would hope or, you know, love to put us in that category. But yeah, so I, I guess like it, it was just incredibly gratifying and validating to the project and all of this time and energy and effort that we put in, but hugely humbling. Like I, um 
to be brutally honest, I even had like momentary, like, man, I'm a film editor. Like I just took a spot from like a big, probably some big director who's waiting and working just as hard as I am. And um, not that I felt like the film didn't, didn't deserve the place or whatever, but I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I had like a lot of complicated emotions. It was also like the first festival, it was going to be our world premiere. So you know, some of the emotions were also just like, oh, wow, this is happening. Like, this is done. I'm I'm not going to make any more changes on it. Like, uh, there were some getting into that festival meant the end of this seven year, eight year journey. And uh, even though we were more than ready to put the lid on it, um, it was emotional. You know, it was definitely like a, a weird thing. It kind of felt like a friend who you've been, I mean, obviously uh, Laurent is a close friend of mine, but the film itself kind of felt like a friend or like a pet that you had been traveling with for the better part of a decade. And, um, you know, like I'm not, I'm not uh, exaggerating to say like, I, I uh, for years had this rule with myself, like I'd come home, if I came home at midnight or if I came home at two, I put in an hour to this movie no matter what, push the rock up the hill and eventually you'll get there. Um, and so it was a lot of work. It was like, you know, working out almost every day on something for seven, eight years, uh, you reach the end of it. And yeah, you kind of like don't know how to feel. It was, it was a, it was a lot. It was a whole way. Yeah. I, I kind of understand. I, uh, like I said, I'm in my second career. My first one is military. I went, uh, into the military, I was 31 days out of from my 18th birthday, and wow. I retired in 2013. And it's like they tell you to take your ball and go home. You're like, but I put so much into this, you know, this is my entire life. And yeah. uh, goodbye, well, old friend. But you know, you gotta, you gotta, you know, keep it pushing and going to the next one. But it is like they've rip something away from you. And I kind of understand when you're talking about that level of commitment and dedication, uh, regardless of your circumstance, one hour a day to this project uh, through completion, you, you know, you've navigated the maze, you've emerged into the light, the prize is a film festival spot and eyes and um, consideration and, and, you know, um, Perhaps it'll it'll make another round next year. Maybe it'll be Sundance next year, Cons or yes. you know, whatever happens. I think that I'm gonna do my best writing to uh, ensure that people understand the impact. What I feel uh, is the impact of someone taking the time to to do this with such dedication, and uh, I appreciate that. As a matter of fact, I'm making it like that one hour a day, eight years. Yeah, I mean, you know, some days it was 12 hours, but at least one hour a day for sure. Mm, that's a lot. Yeah, I have been, I was gonna say like, wow, one hour a day, I've been on some sets. I've, I've worked on some places um, in another life as well. And I'm like, shit, we were on set for 18 hours. You know, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, how, you, how do you do it, you know? Uh, and then you're traveling behind someone who's not only creating music, but going through, you know, different doctor visits and, you know, conversations with themselves, the studio, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. With small unit tactics and you got it done. The trailer's amazing. I can't um, wait to uh, share the trailer and invite people to get ready for it. Now, I have to ask you, since you're the man, uh, behind the plan will it be a, a a vod will we see it maybe in rotation on netflix uh what what's coming up for the you know the man yeah, i certainly hope so i mean like in the short term slam dance has a virtual component so um i think it, it, you just have to sign up for their roku channel i think it's like eight dollars a month or something mm -hmm. and during the festival the, the channel, from what I understand, just kind of becomes all the films from the festival. So right. uh, in short term, you can you can certainly watch it um, from home there. Uh, but, you know, we have a whole run of festivals we're hoping to do after uh, Slamdance. And we'll probably spend the better part of the next year on the road. But uh, at the end of that or at somewhere in between, we, we're that's the plan is we, we're really hoping that uh, 
we can attract a streamer to give this a, a real home um, where anybody can seek it out and we can point people in the right direction. You know, and... I think I think it would be amazing. Is there anything, Zach, that you wanted to cover that I may have neglected? I don't think so. I mean, this is a great conversation. I really appreciate your time. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, last question. Well, no. no I, yeah, I'm, I I'm here. Two. I got nothing but time. <laughs> I got two questions. Look, uh, my wife works for the post office. She leaves at five in the morning and she's just getting home. So I'm going to spend some time with her. Understood. This is a live session, so I'm not cutting that out. I'm just saying this is why <laughs> We're not going for two hours. Uh, I'm going to say hello to her. and uh, But I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. And one would be, what do you feel is the biggest takeaway for the Mad Writer? For the film. There are two lines in the film that I feel like really sum the film up in a way. Um, Towards the towards the uh, end of the film, he's or towards the end of the film, he's talking about um, in the context of his his ear surgeries. Um, he's talking about kind of existence and what it means to be a person and what it means to be, uh, yeah, to be human. And um, he has this great line where he says, "It's heroic to be anything." Like it's heroic to to just try to to be something and to put yourself out there and to be um, to like plant a flag and say I am an artist or I am Larange I am whatever. It's heroic to to put yourself out there and um, it's like a point that I feel in my bones, especially like coming off of this process, this pro this film. Um, you know, to say I was a director was definitely like a, a leap of faith for me. And it, uh, it took a level of, of uh, whatever, of diluting myself or whatever. It took a level of putting myself out there. And so um, there's that, but, but the earlier in the film, there's a, when he's talking specifically about his, his depression growing up and mental health, um, I don't want to botch it. I wasn't ready. I, he, there's a, a line where he says um, that I'm weak, but I'm also incredibly strong. And, um, you know, this, this illness is like that because uh, you get strength from knowing that you carried this weight for so long. And I, that line always really hits me in the face when I, you know, screen the film because it, it feels like it sums him up so well. Like he is this vulnerable, um, at his heart, weak person but who's also incredibly strong and puts up this real strong front and um and i think that's like a brilliant uh poetic uh thing to say about anyone and life in general like we're all putting on a, a mask and we're all weak but pretending to be strong and um i think his point his eventual point there about um that, that he in some way gets strength from knowing that he was able to carry this weight, I think is like a thing that a lot of people could take something from, is, is a, a perspective that a lot of people could um, benefit from from hearing. And uh, so I, I, it's really those two points that I, I hope more than anything people take from the film. Like the main reason I made the film was uh, him and who he was as a person, not even necessarily his music, though his music's incredible and the film would never have been made without it. Um, I do look at it as a film about a person uh, who happens to be a musician and not a film about a musician um, who's dealing with these other things. And so, so yeah, I think that's what I hope people take from it. That was dope. That was perfect. All right. Last but not least. <clears throat> and don't put anybody on blast, but what has been the funniest WTF moment thus far in your professional life? Something that just made you roll on the ground like, oh my God, did that just happen? Oh man, I don't know, there's so many. Um, I'm trying to think of like what I couldn't get in trouble or like <laughs> I end up signing a lot of NDAs in my 
ah. uh, my work. So I don't know. I mean, uh, we've we've dealt with a lot of like I I work with a group of um, with one other editor and a, a two producers and um, and we we kind of work as a team and um, I'll work on separate things, but we all sort of come together and work as a team. And we have worked with so many strange directors or producers or um, especially like uh, kind of ancillary team members that come in yeah. and want to make a, put their foot down on something and you kind of just don't get why they feel so strongly about it. Often it feels like in the end they felt strongly about it so that they could be remembered as being someone in the room or whatever is having a stamp on the project. But um yeah, I guess I'm trying to rack my brain quickly and come up with like a specific one, but I'm failing you. I, there's just too You're many. You're not failing. Because no, no, we've, we've, we've done lots and lots of uh, goofy <laughs> with, with uh, you know, people having some panic attacks when their film is about to come out and stuff like that. So there's been plenty, but uh, I guess nothing that, that, that I couldn't get sued for comes to mind. Okay, well, we, we don't want you to get sued. We no, want no. You. We wish you nothing but continued success. I look forward to uh, next projects. And now, uh, since I do read the liner notes, I um, will be looking. I'm like, ah, I talked to him. I mm -hmm. conversated with Zachary, and he's the editor on this piece. And, you know, I appreciate you taking the time out. It's like, and it's like 11 o'clock for me here. I'm not sure whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast. But you know what? We literally, I walked from one room into here. The room I was in was the color correction room finishing up for the film. So I, we're here. I'm, I'm thrilled to talk to you. I'm so glad you were willing to take the time to talk to me. I, I really appreciate it. I'm not, I'm just, I, this was a must-have conversation. This was a must-have conversation. When I said the mad writer, okay. And I saw that. And, and you know, I get about 200 pitches a day, but your, your team did a really great job presenting the project and I'm like, we've had a relationship for years. I'm like, it's okay. And then when I got into it, I'm like, what? Only one of two films to be picked for this, you know, Slam Dance Film Festival. That's pretty amazing. That's an accolade that, you know, a lot don't get. A lot of people get passed over. And you mentioned like South by Southwest and things like that. And I usually go out and spend like all two weeks uh, and catch the the film, the comedy, and the keynote speakers, as well as the music part. So one of the the fun things is looking for for projects. So getting an opportunity, uh, uh, a little step ahead of everybody else, is kind of dope. And I appreciate the opportunity. And I I really do hope that we can come back and have a second conversation after the screening and as it moves forward. And anything else that you project that you might be you know spearheading that you'd like to push out. Oh, certainly, you've got a, a platform here at the Hype Magazine, man. So I appreciate you. That's great. I really appreciate you too, man. And I'd love to talk to you again after the film. That'd be wonderful. That would be amazing. We'll make it happen. All yeah. right, everybody. The Hype Magazine Live Sessions. A hey, Zachary Keshket. He is the writer, the producer, the director, and editor of what I feel is going to be an amazing documentary that will lead to some around the corner thinking within the industry and dealing with mental health, self-care, um, you know, very courageous film, both the subject matter and the subject of the mad writer, very courageous to allow this team to come in and uh, as Shrek says, peel away the layers and take us on this journey, but I can assure you that we're deposited safely on the other side of this ride. And um, it'll it'll probably spark, spark some more. So uh, thank you so much, Zach. The Hype Magazine Live Sessions. Oh, Slam Dance. Uh, Park City, Utah, January the 20th. That's Friday, I believe that is. And then uh, the following Tuesday, there's another screening at 1 p.m. All of this is on the Slam Dance channel, and you can check it out. We'll have the links um, in the editorial. So check them out, support. And uh, once again, Zach, thank you for your trust, and I appreciate the confidence that you showed in me in having this conversation. Thank you so much for talking to me.
All right. We're out.